Coming right up, we're heading south. The southern part of Beijing is where local culture comes alive. From hundred-year-old shops to theaters, antiques, tea houses, the list goes on and on. There's more to see in Beijing than just the monuments and relics of the elite. Come see how the common Beijinger has lived for centuries. Beijing, ancient capital, modern metropolis, the home of emperors, and the heart of a great cultural tradition. Beijing, old and sedate, young and dynamic, a modern open city on the fast track to reinventing itself. Beijing, where two worlds mingle. Being Beijing is experiencing the life, seeing the sights, sampling the culture. That's being Beijing. When people think about Beijing, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the Forbidden Palace or Tiananmen or the center of the city. But actually, if you want to see the heart of local culture, you might want to head on south. That's right. In southern Beijing, you get a taste of what it's like to be a real Beijinger. I'm Yen, and welcome to Travelog. <laughs> Southern Beijing is perhaps one of the best places to take a stroll. The pace of life here is slow, and the environment is relaxed and friendly. As far back as the Qing Dynasty in the 17th century, the south was populated by commoners, compared to northern Beijing, which was home for the nobles. Thus, the construction of the south was more organic and carefree. Not as glitzy and glamorous as the modern north, the South's old charm takes you back to Imperial China. We start our adventure in the Beijing suburbs, 15 kilometers southwest of Tiananmen at Lugo Bridge. It's the oldest multi-arc stone bridge in Beijing. Constructed in 1189, it's often known as the Marco Polo Bridge, as it was praised by the Venetian traveler Marco Polo during his visit to China in the 13th century. It's known as one of the eight great sites in Beijing. Lining the bridge are posts carved with figures of lions. These beasts are a symbol of power and are believed to offer protection from evil spirits. The people of Beijing say the lions of the Lugo Bridge are too numerous to count and there are small ones hidden in the big ones. They are all carved in different sizes and positions. Near the bridge, we make a stop at a unique museum, Hu Tongzhang. As the name implies, the museum displays the folk history and culture of Beijing. Hu Tongs are the narrow streets and alleys of old Beijing, and Zhang is the surname of the man who collects and makes all the items here. Most eye-catching is the 100-meter Beijing street model. It took Mr. Zhang 10 years to make it by hand. The street shows the old stores of the past and the way people lived. All of this just for 10 yuan admission. Since the old days, southern Beijing has been a place filled with activity and bustling with local culture. And particularly, people would head to the temples to ask for blessing. And during those occasions, these temple fairs would be held because it drew businessmen and locals along with salespeople to bring their goods, their snacks, their crafts, all these different things to the temple fairs. These crafts can still be found today. That's a pretty interesting toy. And you see, this one in particular is a Peking opera figurine. And it sort of spins here. Why 
表现的武打戏比较多。这个为什么他就一拍这个盘子就会转？正因为这个转，我们叫中耳，就因为它底下，在这个它这个身体，它这个自自身有一个重量，重量底下呢有一个配呃有一个配重，配重底下呢是它的中，就是咱们说的中心。Mr. Zhang is a Beijinger who is fascinated with the local culture. He's been producing local handicrafts since he was young and can make almost 100 different types of crafts and toys. Such toys have been passed down generation by generation, like this Mao Ho or hairy monkey. It's made of several types of ancient traditional medicines. The Zongre he's making now is basic and simple made out of paper and a few household items. But the ones he displays take much more time and are painted carefully to depict opera characters' elaborate costumes and face paint. On weekends, the museum organizes special activities that visitors can take part in, such as Peking Opera. Peking Opera originated in the late 18th century as a synthesis of music, dance, art, and acrobatics. The face painting is especially interesting. It reveals a lot of information about a character. For example, a red face usually means bravery and loyalty. A white face symbolizes a sinister character, and a black face represents justice and morality. In ancient times, Peking opera was performed mostly in the open air, in tea houses, or in temple courtyards. The orchestra played loudly, and so the performers had to adopt a piercing style of singing. Performances are divided into civil pieces, which are characterized by singing, and martial pieces, characterized by stunts. This activity is called a piao you hui, and the audience members can take part in the face makeup or just sing along. Marking points in Beijing. Now, back in the old days, there were two paths to enter into Beijing. One was through the east by water, and the other was through the Lugo Bridge, which is back there. And once beyond this point, it's into the city. Welcome to Beijing. In the southeast of Beijing, the most prominent structure is the Temple of Heaven, close to the main north-south axis. It's the best preserved and largest sacrificial building complex in the world. Emperor Yongle of the Ming Dynasty ordered the building of the temple in the 15th century as a place where emperors could pray and worship heaven, a rite which would serve to perpetuate the imperial rule. In ancient times, the sky was believed to be circular, while the earth was square. Thus, the round altar sits on a square base. Symbolic of the meeting of heaven and earth. <laughs> Formerly an imperial complex forbidden to the public, today the Temple of Heaven lies in a park and is open to all those who wish to come. It's located just six kilometers from the center of the city. An entrance is 15 RMB. Every day, bright and early, you can find people, young and old, hanging out in the park, exercising and dancing together. The best time to see these activities in full swing is between 6.30 and 7 a.m. when the temple complex opens. Take a close look. 
and you'll find Olympic champions in the most unexpected events. Lives of Beijing people have always been rich. It doesn't matter what time of year it is, they will sing, dance, and just enjoy life. And so we continue our trip through southern Beijing, which was always a center of commerce in the olden days. And Tianmen, formerly the main gate of the imperial city, was the location of many traditional shops, including Chinese medicine shops, tea shops, and Chinese snack shops. Tianmen Street has become the symbol of old Beijing. It's located just south of Tiananmen and can be reached by bus or subway. If you want to see some old Beijing in the Tianmen area, head to Liu Lichang. One of the most famous shops here is the China Bookstore, the largest old bookstore in China. It was established in 1952 and specializes in collecting ancient books and piles of foreign language books on Chinese culture. At the same time, here you can find all sorts of book-related services. For those who are fans of arts and antiques, get ready to shop. And for those who aren't planning to spend any money, it's worth coming out anyway to this free museum of Chinese culture. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, this 800-meter street was the artistic center of Beijing, where artists and scholars would comprise their pieces and purchase books. When Emperor Qianlong decided to revise the complete library of the four branches of literature, he needed scholars for the project, and Liu Lichang became a center of research. For hundreds of years, Liu Lichang has possessed an air of artistry and culture, and that's even back in the old days when people from all over China would head over here to gather the books and resources needed in order to take the imperial examination. Now the people who also failed the examination would sell their books here along, along the street in this area. And today we can find the sales of paintbrushes and scrolls and ink tablets all here. Liu Lichang literally means glazed tile factory, from the kilns that once stood here producing the ceramics used to build the imperial palace. Later on, the kilns were removed, but then the area had attracted printers, booksellers, vendors of paint, paper, ink stones, and so on. Nowadays, many people purchase stationery here, not so much for practical use, but rather as memorabilia or keepsakes. A simple ink stone may cost thousands of RMB, but who knows, perhaps in the future, it'll be worth double that amount. If antiques are your thing and your interests go beyond stationery, then Panjayar is the place to be. 
Panyayar Market is a haven for bargain hunters who want to collect arts and crafts. Second-hand goods, jewelry, antique locks, Ming pottery, communist memorabilia, the more than 3,000 booths make the market more like a celebration than a shopping area. Formerly open just on weekends, now business is seven days a week. However, Saturdays and Sundays are still the best days to go. And don't forget to bargain for everything. Some people say offer as little as 10 to 25 percent of what the sellers propose and slowly work your way up. But it's really hard to gauge exactly how much things are worth. So just go according to how much it's worth to you. Wow, you are bound to be amazed by the number of antiques in this marketplace and also by the number of people. At Pandayuar, on the weekends, it opens at 4.30 a.m. And you know what they say about the early bird getting the worm? Here, you need a quick eye and a quick hand to pick out those items that are special. I'm going to do some shopping. Bear in mind that not everything may be authentic, and most of us won't be able to tell. In fact, even the dealers themselves may be fooled. But if you're lucky, you just might pick out a fantastic real antique. If not, then you'll be paying for a convincing fake. The market is 100 meters west of the Panjayar Bridge on the East Third Ring Road. It's open from 8.30 a.m. on weekdays and 4.30 a.m. on the weekends. Huh. Wow, you find all sorts of different antiques here, like this box. It's in the shape, sort of, of, a, of an arc up here. And that's because this was actually used as a pillow. That's right. And they had a lock here so that you could put your most prized possessions right under your ear. No one could take it away. I'm not sure if it's comfortable, though. Who knows? You might find that item you thought you never needed, but now can't live without. Antique markets may be where you spend your leisure time, but what did ordinary Beijingers do? Well, they headed to the tea house. Tea constitutes an important part of the long-standing Chinese culture, and tea houses were once scattered far and wide across China. The environment there was cozy, relaxing, and informal. In total, there were six types of basic tea houses. The most simple was the outdoors tea house, where passerbys could rest and drink a hearty bowl of tea. Next were the book tea houses, where people could listen to tales told over a series of days. The third type of tea house were music tea houses, with informal musical performances. Fourth were the tea houses that provided tea, alcohol, and some simple dishes. Fifth were the type where craftsmen and artisans could gather to discuss business. And finally were the type of tea houses that were most encompassing. Tea houses in a courtyard providing meals and performances, which were mostly for the elite. No matter what category they fell in, tea houses were never places to sit down politely and sip tea. Instead, it was an exciting, loud place everyone went to. Founded in 1988, Lao She's Tea House was named after Mr. Lao She, a famous writer. In fact, Tea House was the title of his most famous play. Lao She's Tea House in Tianmen recreates the typical atmosphere of an old Beijing tea house. For Beijingers, the ultimate place to relax is without a doubt a good tea house. Here they can chat with friends, they can watch some local performances, and just chill. And that's exactly why I'm here today. So. Get ready for the show.
Many Beijingers don't just come to the tea house for tea, but rather to watch the performances. And here at Laoshi's Tea House, every night at 7:50 p.m. for almost two hours, you can watch folk arts and drum performances while enjoying some famous tea, palace snacks, and a traditional Beijing environment. Tickets to the show start at 40 RMB and go up to as high as 400, depending on seating. The most exciting traditional performances, including acrobatics, music, magic, as well as Beijing opera and kung fu, can all be found. The acts here, I find this one most eccentric. This lady here is performing the candle song, and it's typically performed by women who hold small metal racks with three burning candles on top in their mouths. It takes a lot of skill to be able to sing and speak the opera clearly at the same time, and the songs they usually sing are for commoners, so the content is usually extremely hilarious. In the past, the place to see these typical Beijing performances was Tianqiao, or the Bridge to Heaven. It once used to span the famous Dragon Beard Ditch. Ming and Qing emperors had to cross it on their way to the Temple of Heaven, thus giving the bridge its name. The bridge, from which this area takes its name, is long gone. Afterwards, it became a gathering place for artists to tell stories, juggle, and perform traditional opera. Today, these people aren't here anymore, but in honor of their performance, a sculpture has been created devoted to the Tianqiao Eight. Eight people who created a sensation with their extraordinary stunts, strange appearance, and bizarre talents. Today, these stunts can no longer be seen on a daily basis, but similar things can be found at the Temple Bears in the south on special occasions. You haven't been to Beijing until you've tried Peking duck, and Quan Ju De is where you get the most authentic duck. This restaurant was established in 1864 during the Qing Dynasty. The ducks here are the finest, and its roasting technique is unique. Creating thin, crisp skins and fragrant, rich meat. Here, the dishes include different parts of the duck, cooked up in a variety of creations, pleasing to the palate and easy on the eye. The finest ingredients and a series of complicated cooking steps is what draws the world's people to Quan Ju De. Roast duck was originally an imperial dish, and today, expect to pay a royal price for your meal. Around 150 to 200 RMB per person. That duck looks succulent. Actually, if you come to Beijing, the most important thing to do for your taste buds is come to Quanzhou Dua to try the Peking roast duck. And now this place is like an institution. It's been around for over 140 years and is sort of like the signature restaurant here in the city. Slicing the meat is an art in itself. A skilled chef is able to cut between 200 and 120 slices in four or five minutes. Each slice with an equal portion of both skin and meat. But if that's too posh for you, you might just want to try some popular Beijing snacks. 
particularly jiajiang noodles. There are 18 different types of sauces here for your noodles, depending on your taste. It's also quite reasonably priced. The environment here is just as it was in the old days. People sit on square hard chairs around a table, and you can hear the service people bustling around and shouting out orders. Besides jiajiang noodles, Beijing has a wealth of other local snacks. Different colors, unrecognizable appearances, sweet, salty, or sour, it's all here. In Beijing, there are many different jiajiang noodle stores, but at all of them, expect to spend about 50 RMB a person, and a real local price. South Beijing is a place where different ethnicities mingle in a friendly community. China's Muslims, the Hui minority, are largely located on Ox Street. Here you can find mosques, Muslim restaurants, and people living together in peace and understanding. Beijing is a city that's both old and new. Old in the sense that there's historical and cultural relics scattered all throughout the city. New in the new face of Beijing, which we'll see more of in the next episode of the Beijing series. I'm Yin, and see you next time.